Hello guys, good evening everyone. How are you? Okay, guys, so where were we in the last class? Could you tell me? Just a second, we'll start, two minutes. Okay, so I think we had discussed uh, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, correct? Yeah, and questions also we have discussed on that. Okay, so so Heisenberg principle suggests that we cannot find out the exact position and momentum of an electron. Okay. Right. And this uh, was the big blow for Bohr's atomic model because unlike Heisenberg, he was suggesting that we had the exact position of an electron. It resides in an orbit, which has a fixed distance from the nucleus. And in that orbit, it has a fixed uh, kinetic energy, potential energy, and its velocity, correct? So according to Bohr's, we know the exact position and velocity of uh, electrons, but Heisenberg said the opposite of it, right? The, the statement given by Heisenberg, it is a contra, it is a contradictory statement to the statement of Bohr's model. Okay, that's why we discarded Bohr's model also later on. Okay, it was not completely wrong, but yes, it was not you know hundred percent correct. Also, few things was uh, not correct in Bohr's model. That's why we you know discarded Bohr's model later on, right? So. After this Heisenberg, a brief mechanical model based on the quantum mechanics developed by the scientist, mainly Schrodinger, okay? And based on that, we talk about the presence of electron, where the electron presents, what is the exact thing within an uh, atom, 
in which the electron is present. So we get all those ideas, right? That is based on wave quantum mechanics, right? That is wave mechanical model. Okay, so this, uh, you know, obviously the quantum mechanics, we won't be able to understand it properly at this level. So we'll just take a few reference of it, okay? We won't go into depth of it. We'll take a few reference of it to understand the Schrodinger equation, okay? Right, so one statement first you write down and then we'll move on to it. Write down the statement. When Heisenberg uncertainty principle I'll also write down it. Just a The statement is when Heisenberg based on the data given or you like can easily find out. Yes, with practice you will have the idea of it and which formula we should use. But based on the data given you can understand. Okay, so write down this particular statement here. When Heisenberg uncertainty principle when Heisenberg uncertainty principle came into existence or came into picture picture the concept of the concept of electron revolving around the nucleus around the nucleus in different orbit in different orbit where the position and velocity velocity are exactly known was replaced by was replaced by was replaced by the probability was replaced by the probability of finding an electron in a particular particular space or volume right so after heisenberg we said what that you know the concept that we get is 
this is an orbit, suppose we have, and this is a volume, right? A three-dimensional space of volume. So initially, Bohr suggested that electron revolves in a fixed path called, called orbit, circular path called orbit. This is a nucleus here. So this is orbit, right? Since Heisenberg suggests that the exact position and momentum we cannot find out, so fine, we said what? Okay, we cannot pinpoint the location of electron, but we can say, okay, the electron present in this region. In this region, definitely the electron is present. Right, so the certainty here, it, you know, it converts into probability. After this Heisenberg, we started talking about the probability of finding an electron. We don't talk about certainty now, but we started talking about the probability of finding an electron. Right? So this is the three-dimensional space. And in this space, we can say the probability of finding an electron is maximum. Correct? So this was the biggest you know, uh, achievement of this particular theory. We are not talking about a pinpoint location of an electron, but we are talking about a volume in which the probability of finding an electron is maximum. Okay? So what is this? This is three-dimensional space or volume, 3D space. After this concept only, the entire thing, we got to know about a new concept and this concept we call it as orbital, right? So after this only, like I told you in the beginning, there's nothing called orbit within an atom. It's the thing is orbital, not orbit. The concept of orbit was vanished after this, and we started talking about orbital, the ITL, orbital, right? So write down the statement here, just one line we have. It is a three-dimensional space, orbital write down, it is a three-dimensional space, orbital write down, it is a three-dimensional space where the probability of finding an electron is maximum. Three dimensional space where the probability of finding an electron is maximum. Right, so this is what orbital. So after this, we won't talk about orbit. Orbit is nothing, like it won't exist. The correct thing is orbital, right? So this thing we came to know when, when we got to know the wave characteristics of electron from de Broglie wavelength, right? That all microscopic particles, when in motion, when in motion, contains wave characteristics and when we study these wave characteristics, we'll get to know about all these things, correct? So this is, after this only, a new model has been developed, given by the scientist, mainly Strodinger, okay, but the research and the study was done by Heisenberg and, Sein and Strodinger both, right? And this we call it as quantum mechanical model of an atom, write down. quantum mechanical model. Okay, so what is quantum mechanical model? Write down. It is based on the quantum mechanics. It is based on quantum mechanics. See, there are basically two things. One is classical mechanics, other one is quantum mechanics. Classical mechanics, where we have the <laughs> Newton's laws of motion and all these things are valid, right? On, mic on macroscopic objects, like any object, we apply Newton's laws of motion. But when it comes to 
microscopic objects like electron which consists which contains both particle as well as wave characteristics okay so the particles which has dual nature for those kind of particles the classical mechanics fails it is not valid right don't give you correct reason classical mechanics newton's laws of motion we don't apply into that right basically newton's laws of motion that is uh, classical mechanics is app applied for macroscopic particles not for micro okay for macroscopic particles so for microscopic particles we have quantum mechanics we used to understand their behavior properties with the help of quantum mechanics right on next line right the quantum mechanics it is based on quantum mechanics next write down quantum mechanics is a theoretical science quantum mechanics is the theoretical science that deals with that deals with the study of the motion of microscopic objects right the theoretical science that deals with the study of the motions of microscopic particles which has both or write down which has dual characteristics okay which deals with the motion the study of the motion of the microscopic objects which has both characteristics both characteristics means wave and particle nature okay <clears throat> next time you write down it is developed by heisenberg and and schrodinger it is developed by heisenberg and schrodinger heisenberg and schrodinger now you see what happens here schrodinger actually he defines a new function here to understand this behavior he defines a new function that is psi represented by this line this kind of trishul if you uh, have sin lord shiva okay similar kind of you no know, term we have here right this we call it as this kind of this okay this is this is psi this is psi the term we call it as psi okay so schrodinger has given this term and this term is called the wave function wave function or amplitude function amplitude function wave function or amplitude function correct okay this uh you know you can compare this with the the amplitude of any wave any light wave like light wave has some amplitude any wave has some amplitude so this is the amplitude of electron wave you can say it is the term we define he defined for the waves associated with electron correct and hence we call it as the amplitude of actually it is the amplitude of electron wave electron wave okay so light wave for example you see for example if you have light wave light wave has amplitude a suppose has amplitude 
a suppose i am assuming this right then what we say the intensity of light wave i is directly proportional to a square the square of the amplitude right similarly if you have an electron wave an electron wave with with amplitude with amplitude psi okay so intensity of electron wave is also directly proportional to psi is square okay i'm discussing these things here but you won't get question on this okay i'm just discussing to you for you to have an idea of it nothing much you know required here intensity is psi square since this represents the amplitude function or wave function of an electron and intensity is that proportional to psi square this means what psi square is what psi square represents represents the intensity of electrons psi square represents intensity of electron if you have more value of psi square more will be the intensity of electron and more will be the probability to get an electron right that's why psi is square we also call it as probability per unit volume probability per unit vol volume this also we call it as probability density function probability density function so this is what you should understand what is psi psi is the wave function or amplitude function but psi square is a probability density function density means per unit volume calculation we are doing charge density means charge per unit volume similarly probability density means probability per unit volume correct so these are the two terms given by them okay now with the help of this wave function one more thing this wave function actually it consists of all informations of electron okay it consists of consists of all information for an electron for an electron so if you want to get some information about electron you should take wave function of that particular electron and you should study the wave function that is it it gives you all the properties of electron like its energy and other things right okay one point is this another point it is probability per unit volume so suppose we have psi square is probability per unit volume suppose we have a volume a very small volume we are considering right this is the volume and the volume is three dimensional thing right so if very small volume we assume that is dx into dy into dz this is a very small volume we have we are considering this right very small volume so psi square is equals to we have already seen it is probability per unit volume okay so probability if you find out from this equation probability is equals to psi square into volume and that would be psi square into dx dy and dz this is the probability so if you integrate this three times because we have three terms dx dy and dz psi square dx dy 
dz, this gives you the probability of an electron in this particular volume. In this particular volume. Okay. So maximum probability is 1. So probability of getting an electron is triple integration of this psi square dx dy dz is equals to 1. The maximum probability is this. Okay, this is the thing here. Now, for different, different volume, you don't have to solve this. Triple integration is not there in your textbook, right? So for different, different volume, we have different value of psi also. Is it uh, Shitish? Acha, we'll quickly then. Uh, I, I forgot, you did not tell me. Anyways, uh, to, can you tell me what is the last portion I discussed? Acha, we did Hunsun. Hunsun. Okay. Fine. So uh, that's why I, I was thinking that you are not asking any doubt. Okay. Anyways, so guys, we have done it already, no? Anyways. Okay, okay, fine. I got it. I got it. It means we have done uh, all those things, uh, quantum number, other things we have done, right? That's fine. No problem. Just you will. Okay, fine. You had a revision of it. Fine. So actually, um, Okay. Electronic configuration we have done, Hansu we have done. Okay, nodal surface we need to do. Correct. Okay, one last thing we'll see. See, this equation actually, it has two components. I'll tell you what it is. This equation has two components. I'm just leaving all these things now. Psi actually has two components. When you solve this, I'm doing this, you know, for you just to because one question they ask into this, a pattern is there. I'll show you what that pattern is. Okay. Just a second. So, this orbital wave function, if you solve, it has two component. This one I haven't done, so you can copy this down. Psi has two component. That is, psi will write r, that is the radial point of it. And this one is the angular part of it, theta and phi. theta and phi. So basically, if you consider an axis, only one question they ask on this, I'll show you how, what kind of question they ask. Suppose we have an, ele an electron present somewhere here. This is the point here. So it will have some distance from the nucleus, correct? So this is the distance we have, suppose. This is the radial distance, that is R, this part. Right. And we'll have some angle over here, theta. And when you place the perpendicular line from this, like this way, we'll have some angle with this. Axis that is five. 
Okay, this is not theta actually. Theta is this side. This side is theta. Right. So this represents the angular position of this electron, theta and pi. And this is radial, the distance from this nucleus. So this part is, is radial. And this part here is is angular radial and angular okay this radial part of the wave function so wave function has two parts radial and angular wave function depends upon the two value depends on the principal quantum number n and azimuthal quantum number l n and l Right. It gives us an idea of size of the orbital. Size. We have an idea of size from this. Angular part is, it is the angular part of wave function, right? And it is represented by, by L. I'll write down here L, that is azimuthal quantum number. And it depends upon the two value on L and magnetic quantum number M, right? And it gives us an idea of, of shape of the orbital. Idea of shape, okay? So that's why from Schrodinger wave equation, we got to know about three different quantum numbers, N, L, and M, right? Not the spin quantum number. Now, what question they ask? They sometimes gives you this relation. They'll write down the wave function this way. That is suppose I'll write down 420 here. Right, like this they'll write down and they'll ask you which orbital is this? Like this, they ask, ask the question. Okay, so this number that you have written here, four, two, and zero. This actually in the order of this n, l, and m. So if you see this number, it means if you compare the two, n value is four, right? L value is two, and m value is zero. Could you tell me the order with the orbital with this three quantum number? Which orbital is this? Tell me which orbital is this? L value is two, so it is D. It is not P, Shithis, right? So it is four D Z square because M is zero. So this is what you can understand from this particular information. I'll change, oh, shit, just a second. Okay, next, yes, the next um, we have to uh, understand the last uh, concept here of this chapter, that is nodal surface. Very simple one, two, three things you have to keep in mind, nothing much.
write down these are the surface these are the surface where surface where the probability of finding an electron these are the surface where the probability of finding an electron is zero of finding an electron is zero right that is the nodal surface nodal surface we have two types okay one is a spherical node or radial node two types the first one write down spherical node we also call it as radial node a spherical node means we have a yes nodal surface it is a surface where the probability of finding an electron is zero it is a surface where the probability of finding an electron is zero correct two types we have a spherical node or radial node both are the same thing a spherical node means what will have a spherical surface where the probability of finding an electron is zero right thus you need to memorize the formula we use to find out the spherical node and the formula is n minus l minus 1 gives you the number of spherical node okay another type we have that is non spherical node non spherical node we also call it as angular node angular node the formula of this is l it's non spherical we don't present represent this on the graph okay there's this formula you should know and few things i'll tell you what you have to keep in mind quickly here yeah? okay so if i ask you what is the total number of nodes that would be the sum of the two n minus 1 okay now there is a graphical representation of this nodes easy one that you have to understand okay i'll show you the graph here just a second all of you copy down this could you tell me how many uh, nodes we have in 1s orbital number of nodes in what s orbital tell me number of nodes in 1s number of nodes in 2s okay total number of nodes if i ask you the spherical node here just you need you need to use the formula 1 minus l value is 0 this is 0 angular node is also 
because it is s subshell angular node is zero so there is no nodal surface for 1s orbital right if you talk about 2s then the number of spherical node is 1 A spherical node is two minus zero minus one. That is one, and the number of angular node is angular node is zero again because it's s subshell. Angular node would be always zero for s subshell. Now, based on this number of nodes that we have, we can discuss for the graph here. Just a second, I'll show you the graph. Just a second, Pradyun. See, node, Pradyun. Node is a surface where the probability of finding an electron is zero. Right. It is a surface where the probability of Finding an electron is zero. That is what it is. Okay. So you see this graph. I'll explain this graph. Two three points you have to understand here. First of all, if they ask you number of nodes, you can find out easily. Right. That with this formula, that these are the nodes present into this. Now, based on this, we can draw the graph. You see. For one s orbital, we have the graph of psi and r, psi square and r, and it is psi square four pi r square d square. You see this term here. This term is present over here. So psi square, if you remember, it is the probability per unit volume, and if you multiply this with four pi r square, which is the surface area, into dr, this term becomes the volume actually. So this integration of this it represents the probability. So this axis is probability, and this is the distance from the uh, nucleus. Did you understand the three? Uh, you know, the three graphs where we have the axis. This is psi and r, psi square and r, and probability and distance from the nucleus. R is the distance from the nucleus. So these two graphs we do not have any control because we don't know the relation of psi and r, and but this will be a curve here. It won't be a straight line like this. So psi r graph goes like this, psi square r graph more steeper curve goes like this, and psi square r that is probability versus r graph it goes up. We'll have a maximum probability, right, and then comes down. But remember this graph won't. Touch the x-axis; otherwise, the probability becomes zero, which is not the case of one s <coughs> orbital. Did you understand the first three graph? Just a second, guys. Uh, just a second. I think I have a better picture of it. Uh, let me just cross check. This one. Mm. 
Oh, I think it's it got deleted. Did we? See this graph only. See in another class I had drawn this. So first three graphs did you understand? Or you was there in the last class of quantum number? N is the principal quantum number and L is the azimuthal quantum number. Yes, so before coming for the class, you should must revise once or quickly, right? A brief, brief revision is must required. Okay, so did you understand the first three graph? Obviously, you see psi and R relation we do not have. So it is a curve, it goes like this, right? If there is no node, then this graph won't cross the x-axis. It will be above x-axis only. Third graph, did you understand? Third graph is more important. The probability of a graph is more important. Did you understand the third graph? Anj, did you get it? Now, if you see 2s orbital here, the 2s orbital, we know we have one node here. Means there will be one spherical surface where the probability of finding an electron is zero or there is no electron present here. Yes, psi square is probability density. That is nothing but probability per unit volume. Okay, so since we have one node here, that's why this graph you see it comes down, crosses the x axis, and then goes up. Just convention wise, we'll write this says above this is positive and this is negative. And you see, this is psi wave function. And wave function, I told you already, it can be positive, can be negative, both. Right? That's why we have positive, negative, both. And this point where it, it touches the x axis, then psi is zero here. Psi is zero means psi is square is zero. Psi is square is zero means probability is zero. And when probability is zero, that point here, it becomes the node. Did you get it? Psi is square, you have to just draw the mirror image of this negative part. This negative part becomes positive. Just above this will draw. Remember both the graph here and here further, it won't touch the X axis. If it touches, it means that point also we have a node which is not possible because we have only one node here. Right. Then probability graph, if you see, it goes like this. Probability graph always starts from the origin because we know electron cannot present in the nucleus. Right? So always in the nucleus here, the probability is zero. So always this graph you see, it starts from the origin, goes up and then comes down. Now, if you have this kind of graph, because like I said, probability graph is more important. If you have this kind of graph, the peak that you have, the mountain structure that you see here, right? If you have two peak, right? Then we'll have one node. That's what I have written here. Number of peak is one more than the number of node. Probability graph always starts with zero, right? The point at which it touches the axis here, there the probability becomes zero and that becomes the nodal surface. Okay, did you understand this? Yes, all of you got it? 
नो डाउट प्लीज रिस्पॉन्ड ओके सो यू शुड नो द ग्राफिकल रिप्रेजेंटेशन वॉट थिंग्स वी कैन कंक्लूड फ्रॉम द ग्राफ दैट इज वन टाइप ऑफ क्वेश्चन दे आस वन टाइप दे आस्क यू दैट द नंबर ऑफ नोट प्रेजेंट सो फॉर दैट यू जस्ट यूज द फॉर्मूला यूल फाइंड आउट द नंबर ऑफ नोड ओके अनदर थिंग दैट यू शुड नो दैट वॉट आर द नोडल प्लेन वी हैव फॉर डिफरेंट डिफरेंट ऑर्बिटल्स राइट इट्स वेरी सिंपल यू सी इफ द फॉर टू पी ऑर्बिटल वी राइट हियर for 2p orbital number of spherical node is n minus l minus 1 that is 2 minus 2 minus 1 minus 1 that is 0 there is no spherical node and the number of number of angular node non spherical is one here right so if the orbital is px for px orbital we have one angular node and that nodal plane for this is yz plane perpendicular one right the perpendicular plane is yz plane and this is the nodal plane for px orbital right if you have py orbital the nodal plane is xz the perpendicular one is the nodal plane if you have pz orbital then the nodal plane is xy plane xy plane and this is the answer here so you should know what are the nodal planes we have similarly few things you have to memorize okay 3d orbital you write to copy down this one i'll go to the next page then okay now if you talk about for 3d orbital could you tell me how many nodal surface we have for 3d orbital the spherical node two that's right the spherical node A spherical node is three minus two minus one. That is zero. An angular node is two. Okay. So if it is, you see here, if it is d x y orbital, it is in x y plane. So y z and z x. Y, Z, and Z, X are nodal planes for for D, X, Y orbital. 
if you take dyz then the nodal plane is xy and y z, xy and zx xy and zx if you take dxz the nodal plane is xy and zy so we have two two nodal planes here one exception we have into this one right write down the node how to copy down this write down dz square has no nodal planes dz square has no nodal plane but it has but it has nodal surface as cones conical shape we have there right nodal surface as cones c o n e s okay so this one is an exception you must uh, remember this so this is it for nodal surface okay they will sometimes ask you that what is the nodal plane for this one or nodal surface for this one you should know like this the perpendicular one is the nodal plane or nodal surface now this is the second type of question they ask third and the last type here we have sorry fourth and the last type we have one is related with the number of nodes other one one is the graph types third one is this what are the what are nodal planes we have and the fourth one is this type of question i will show you here the question is the wave function for 3s electron is given so wave function is psi psi for 3x is given 3s not x psi for 3s orbital is given is 1 by 81 root 3 pi into 1 by a not 3 by 2 it's 3 by 2 open bracket 27 minus 18 r by a not plus 2 r by a not is square close bracket e to the power minus r 3 a not a not is the orbit the first radius of the first orbit this is the psi value it is given relation of psi and r it says the wave function of 3s electron is given by this and it has a node at it has a node at r is equals to r not find the relation between r not and a not try this one what it is this equation you are saying yes this equation you will get once you solve the uh, schrodinger wave equation that hamiltonian things and all but that is not there in the syllabus right so we don't have to do with this equation anything 
you just need you you just have to use one condition and that is it that's right ansh that is what you need to do where is e we have e we do not have here r by n oh, e is the electron no is that exponential or e e to the power answer i'm not sure with i have to do this all of you solve this anyone i got one response pradyun others what is the answer you are getting okay fine you can take the help of calculator if you want yes it is a square that's why it has two values okay fine i'll do this i don't know the answer i'll just have to do this okay see this 
it has a node at r is equals to r not node means what it the probability will be zero of finding an electron psi square is zero and that means psi is zero so psi for 3s at r is equals to r not is zero so we have to substitute this psi is equals to zero over here and solve this equation so when you substitute you will get r not by a not plus 2 times r not by a not square is equals to 0 that is what you need to solve so when you solve this quadratic r not by a not is equals to 18 plus minus Four into two into this, that is two hundred sixteen. Four. So could you tell me the answer here? Eighteen plus minus this is three twenty four minus two sixteen. So it is hundred one not eight root over by this. Tell me this value. What is the root over of one not eight? Okay, so it is 10.4 plus minus this. So we have 28.4 by 4 and 7 point, sorry, and 10.4, uh, 18 minus 10.4, that is uh, 7.6 by 4. So that would be. 7.1 and 1.9. So R naught is equals to we get here 0.1 A naught and R naught is equals to 1.9 A naught. Now you see one thing if you observe here, you'll understand this particular thing very easily. If I ask you the question, how many nodal plane 3s orbital would have? 3s. How many nodal plane for 3s? It is 2. Right? A spherical and no angular node, 2 is spherical node. Means we should have 2 surface from the nucleus spherical surface where the probability of finding an electron is zero this is one surface another surface according to this point right is zero and that's why we have two value of r not here did you get this means at this distance from the nucleus and this distance from the nucleus will have two spherical surface where the probability of finding an electron is zero. Yes, that is technically not possible because it is for 3s. It is for 3s, right? Then we should have two nodes. Then the equation must be quadratic, correct? Hence, we must get two values here. A perfect quadratic you are talking about. No, that won't be the case. You won't get it here. Right. So for those orbitals where the spherical nodes are three, you will have a cubical equation here. Right. You will have a cubical equation. So one thing also you can observe. I, they have mentioned this 3s over here. Sometimes what happens, they'll just give you 
the wave function for an orbital has this relation. I'll give you like this. Then what is the number of nodes we have here? The number of nodes would be the solution of it. Number of nodes would be the solution of it, right? So in that case, if you are getting perfect square, then we'll have only one node there. However, the square is the, uh, you know, the equation is a quadratic equation. But if 3s is mentioned, then you won't get perfect square there. If 4s is mentioned, you won't get perfect square there. Right. If they have mentioned 2s, then it is possible to have perfect square. What is x to the power q minus 1? See, equation, see, uh, shit is equation, yeah, equation could be anything. It could be anything. You are giving the simplest one. The equation won't be that simple, right? It could be anything, but we should have three different values for three spherical nodes. Yes, we can have imaginary plane also here. All these are orbitals are also imaginary. It is not like there's a dumbbell kind of thing present within an atom. But if you're talking about imaginary in terms of complex number, then that won't be the case here. You won't get that kind of equation. Okay, understood this? Yeah, so that, that kind of equation, root over of minus, I, minus one, you won't get that. Those kind of equation you won't get. Okay. Right, correct. So these are the three, four types of questions they ask in uh, for nodal planes. Okay, not that difficult. However, there are many things to understand if you actually want to understand this, but those things are not in our slippers. So like, you know, you can understand these three, four things, how to solve the question. And that is whenever you get this kind of equation, no, you have nothing to do, but you need to put psi is equals to zero. That is how we'll proceed in that. So this is it for this particular chapter. That is atomic structure. We have done everything in uh, so detail. So we'll start with the next chapter and that is periodic classification or periodic properties. See, in this particular chapter, we are going to study about uh, atomic series, a uh, periodic table. Plus, we will also study about the various different terms. Remember in organic chemistry, GOC, I have used a term electronegativity. Remember that? This one we have only spherical, no angular nodes here. That we cannot see from this one. Right, since we have R value, so we can only get the radial nodes, a spherical one. No, we can only get the radial one from this. Okay, so next write down the chapter we are going to start with periodic properties. So I was talking about electronegativity. Remember, we have used the term electronegativity in organic. Right? So those kind of terms we are going to see in this chapter. Right? So those kind of terms we are going to understand here in this chapter.
okay what is the term what is the application and other things correct so first of all we'll discuss about the periodic table right you must have the understanding of periodic table first okay and then we can uh, talk about those terms that we have to discuss correct so periodic table when we got to know about different different elements then we try to arrange those elements in according to their uh, you know uh, properties or we can say uh, electronic configuration or according to their atomic number atomic mass so in that way i'll discuss or you know in that way we have we got different different theories that atoms are arranged in this way like we frost has given one theory one we have newland octave rules we have one is dobernier triad mendeleev's periodic table and then modern periodic table right so few things are important here we'll discuss all these theory one by one so these things are actually similar to the atomic models that different different scientists they have given their own theory you know regarding the distribution of subatomic particles within an atom and those theory we call it as atomic models so here also we have different theories of arrangement of atoms means how do we how can we arrange an atom in a proper format in a proper way right so that we have different different theories we get okay so the first theory that we get is it is given by the scientist called frost okay i'll just write down just a second okay so the different theory is given by the different different scientists and this will discuss under the development of periodic table periodic table okay all of you write down the first theory that is given here is we call it as prouts hypothesis obviously this was not correct wrong and hence we discarded discarded it later okay so what he suggests that all atoms in the world is made up of hydrogen only write down quickly these things are not important even the recent you uh, know the syllabus uh, thing they have changed this thing this is not given in your syllabus but for je sometimes they ask questions on this the background of the history of all this that's why i'm doing this okay so write down all of you according to this all elements are made up of hydrogen made up of hydrogen and the atomic weight of any element is given by atomic weight of any element is n where n is the where n is the number of hydrogen atom present in this number of hydrogen atom present so obviously this was uh, wrong so we discarded it right so this was wrong the second theory was was dobernier triad rule this one is important you'll get question on this also dobernier triad rule d o b e r n i e r all of you write down
write down he suggested that within a group of three elements he suggested that within a group of three elements of similar physical and chemical properties of similar physical and chemical properties similar physical and chemical properties the atomic weight the atomic weight the atomic weight of the middle element the atomic weight of the middle element is the mean of the other two example you see if you talk about lithium sodium and potassium okay the atomic weight of lithium is 7 potassium is uh, 39 and the average of these two is 23 and 23 is the atomic weight of sodium so it is a dobernier trial okay if you talk about sulfur selenium and tellurium it is 32 sulfur is 32 sulfur is 32 and this one is 128 and the average of the two is 80 selenium is 80 this three forms a dobernier trial okay chlorine bromine iodine it is 35.5 chlorine iodine is 127 and the average of the two you see if you get here um uh, 54 plus 8 162.5 divided by 2 the average we are getting 81.25 the average but the atomic mass of bromine is 80 so it is close actually not exact value but it is close and forms a dobernier trial similarly we can find out for the other uh, you know elements also so these kind of elements dobernier he suggested that the elements of physical chemical and of similar physical and chemical properties forms this kind of trial okay but this also not valid for all the elements so we have we discarded this particular thing also but in the test and question in the book also you see the last few is question which of these groups shows dobernier trial or follows dobernier trial rule okay did you copy this third theory we have new land octave rules octave rule or octave law okay write down this according to this theory write down according to this theory
if the elements are arranged if the elements are arranged in order to their in order to their increasing atomic weights if the elements are arranged in order to their increasing atomic weights every eighth element every eighth element will have the similar properties every eighth element will have the similar properties to the first one like the first and eighth note in music like the first and eighth note in music write it down i'll just discuss you discuss with you okay again i'm repeating this If you arrange in order to their increasing atomic weights, every eighth element had will have the similar properties to the first one, like the first and eighth note in music. For example, you see if we have lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. and then again sodium magnesium boron silicon phosphorus sulfur chlorine and potassium see it is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 right so every eighth element will have the same properties like we have first and eighth note of music like sa re ga ma pa dha ni sa right again you see ni sa first and eighth one have the same thing right same note we have sa and sa similarly the property of lithium and sodium is also very similar okay so this is what this is newland octave uh, rule but this is also not found to be correct and hence we discarded this also this one and this one this is the rule we have correct you learned octave rule stop it is done hello are you there okay <clears throat> next one the fourth attempt was made and this we call it as lothal meyer curve lothal meyer curve i'll show you this curve you don't have to draw this okay just i'll explain few points here uh
दिस इज लॉथल मेयर का वी हैव so this curve is drawn between between atomic volume and atomic mass this is the first thing you should keep in mind atomic volume and atomic mass then what he observe here that all the electropositive elements right elements of first group lithium sodium potassium no rubidium cesium all electropositive elements alkali metals the first group occupy the peak of the curve it present over here you see this lithium sodium potassium rubidium cesium this red dot is alkali metals group 1 okay the lesser electropositive element which is the elements of group 2 right it occupy the descending position of the curve you see this beryllium comes over here it occupy the descending position beryllium then magnesium then calcium strontium barium right this is alkaline earth metal group 2 similarly non metals and metalloids are in the bottom of the curve we have like this you see a uh, metalloids cobalt copper zinc non metals fluorine bromine here right we have uh, sulfur here zirconium here iodine here all these are on the bottom of the curve so what he said actually that on the basis of this curve he what he concluded right on this point he proposed that the physical property of the elements the physical properties of the elements physical properties of the elements are are just a second yeah i'm repeating it on the basis of this curve he proposed that the physical properties of the elements are periodic function of their atomic weight of their atomic weight so from this particular thing we came to know about this fact that physical properties are the function of their atomic weight right atomic weight this becomes the basis of the next theory and that is the mendeleev periodic table okay write down this becomes the basis of mendeleev periodic table which is the next theory we have atomic weight you see this periodic function of their atomic weight okay this becomes the basis of mendeleev periodic table now what is mendeleev periodic table the modern one that we are using it is just a modified version of mendeleev periodic table okay so write down the heading mendeleev periodic table
Okay, write down. This periodic table is based upon the fact this periodic table is based upon the fact that physical and chemical properties of an element based upon the fact that physical and chemical properties of an element physical chemical properties of elements are the periodic function of their atomic weight of their atomic weight so this table pre mendeley periodic table it is based upon the atomic weight not atomic number atomic weight right so basis is the atomic weight first thing is that right and what he did actually he was the first scientist who arranged the elements in horizontal and vertical manner means, means horizontal rows and vertical columns right and this horizontal rows are called periods and the vertical columns are called groups so according to mendeleev that time there were seven periods seven periods and periods means horizontal rows and eight groups and eight groups that is vertical column vertical column okay next next point you write down each group up to 7th each group up to 7th is divided into two subgroups a and b each group up to 7th is divided into two groups a and b so we have two subgroups so subgroup a is the normal element normal element up to 7 it is right and subgroup b it is a transition element transition element okay next next point see why these points the facts are important because sometimes especially for mendeleev sometimes they'll ask you this question which statement is correct with respect to the mendeleev periodic table so these informations you should have that's why i'm dictating you this next write down the eighth group was consist of nine elements eighth eighth group 
was consist of nine elements next one the elements belongs to same group exhibit similar properties right elements belongs to the same groups has similar property and hence this was the biggest achievement that the study of elements becomes easier the properties of the elements because same group elements have similar properties that is what that <coughs> that's what the biggest advantage here okay mendeleev periodic table the disadvantage was what that write down the disadvantage is or drawback you can say is the position of hydrogen is uncertain the position of hydrogen is uncertain it has been placed in 1a and 7a it has been placed in 1a and 7a group 7a group because of the resemblance with both groups okay so few there are many different different points we have in this i have just given you the the important one which you should keep in mind okay all those things you don't have to memorize clear now based on this only like i said mendeleev was the first one was the first scientist who arranged the atoms in elements in that horizontal and vertical fashion okay rows and column concepts he bring in right based on this only we have our modern periodic table that we also call it as modified mendeleev periodic table or modern periodic table right so write down the heading the last one in this that is modern periodic table which is nothing but modified mendeleev periodic table right proposed by mosley it is proposed by mostly based on atomic number so this is the biggest difference in the two the previous one was based on atomic mass and this one is based upon atomic number what he did actually he took a metal uh, elements like metal um, uh, atom right metal surface he took and on this metal surface he bombarded he bombarded high speed electrons high speed electrons on different different metal surface 
means with different different metal surface this experiment is done and what he observed that that when it strikes this metal surface it emits x ray right from the surface of the metal it emits x ray this is mosley's experiment it emits x rays and the frequency of this x ray that is new is found to be directly proportional to the atomic number it is actually root over of it root over of frequency directly proportional to the atomic number right and when you write down the relation here this new it becomes root over of new is equals to a into z minus b where this z is the atomic number here a and b are constant just a second anj okay write down a and b are constant here are constant z is the atomic number so what happened here he took a metal surface different different metal surface and he strikes high speed electron onto the, on the, on this metal surface and he observes that that x rays comes out in this experiment right and the frequency of this x rays the root over of it is directly proportional to the atomic number of the metal that we are taking in we have a graph for this actually okay the graph when he plotted of different different frequency with atomic number and root nu right into 10 to the power minus 10 you'll get a graph like this straight line passes through origin and hence the relation is okay this is the modern periodic table that is modified periodic table right and this we also call it as the long form of periodic table right long form modern periodic table write down few characteristics of this few properties here this modern periodic table or long form periodic table based on mosley's experiment the experiment i will show you right that experiment that we that metal surface strikes with the uh, high beam high you know speed electrons based on this experiment the long form periodic table it gives it contains seven periods and 18 groups vertical columns and 18 groups the elements belongs to the same group the elements belongs to the same group has the same number of electrons 
belongs to the same group has the same number of electrons in the valence shell okay so these are the properties we have for long form or modern periodic table few facts in this we write down write down bromine is the only non metal which exists in liquid form bromine is the only non metal which exists in liquid form okay iodine is solid iodine is solid bromine is the only non metal exist in liquid form there are 11 gaseous elements there are 11 gaseous elements that is hydrogen nitrogen you can write down the symbol hydrogen nitrogen oxygen fluorine chlorine and the noble gases what all noble gases we have tell me what all noble gases we have xenon is x e n o n okay helium neon argon krypton xenon radon right plus the five elements i told you hydrogen nitrogen oxygen fluorine chlorine and these six elements exist in gaseous halogen the physical state of halogen you must remember right i told you fluorine chlorine are gases bromine liquid and iodine is solid okay now we'll have the uh, will must have the understanding of periodic table here which is very important so i'll show you the periodic table first see this okay so you must have the understanding of the entire periodic table see this is atomic number 1 then 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 13 14 15 like that okay this group that you have here the classification of elements you see 
this is s block first and two this two are s block if you see here we have 10 groups from this point to this point we have 10 groups here from this point to this point and this is d block d block this has six group from this point to this point you see and this is p block We know P subshell can have how many electrons maximum? P subshell can have how many electrons? Maximum six electrons. So you can have you can have NP one configuration, NP two, NP three, NP four, NP five, NP six. So since we have six different configuration, that's why we have six different groups. Could you write down the electronic configuration for boron, five electrons? It is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. See group 13, this one, 3a. 1a, 2a, 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, 7a, 8a. Right? So either you can say in terms of a and b, like we had in uh, Mendeleev periodic table, I told you it, the groups are divided into two categories. One is for normal elements and one is for transition elements. So transition elements are b. You see this? It is 3B, 4B, 5B, 6B. This group is 3B, 4B, 5B, 6B, and so on. This group is 1A, 2A, then it is 3A, 4A, 5A, and so on. Okay? This AA term, if you see here, 3A means there are three electrons in the valence shell. Okay? I'm just you know, giving you the idea of it, like what all things you can conclude from this. Suppose you have an, we have an element belongs to 7A group. It means in its valence shell, we have 7 electrons. You can check this. I'll show you. I said what? Elements belongs to 7A group. Suppose we have fluorine. Belongs to 7A. Write down the electronic configuration of fluorine and tell me the electrons in the outermost shell. If you write down it is 1S2, 2S2, 2P, 5, 9 electrons. You see, the outermost shell is not 2p. Outermost shell is second, 2, which contains two subshell, S and P. The total number of electrons are 5 plus 2, 7. How many of you understood this? No doubt. Okay. So similarly, if you know the groups, 3a, 4a, 5a, 6a, 7a, you can directly say this is the number of electrons in the outermost shell. Like you see, boron is 3A. So it must have three electrons in the outermost shell. You see this configuration? Three electrons. Clear? All of you, please type in CLR if you get it. Tell me fast, quickly. Okay, thank you. Another thing is what? This is one thing that you can conclude. Another thing. When you write down the configuration, 2s2, 2p1, right? So p1 means it is the first group of p block. p2 means it is the second group of p block. p3, third group. p4, fourth group. For example, you see, boron is 2p1, belongs to the first group of p block. This is the first group. For carbon, if you draw, carbon has six electrons, right? So in the last, it would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. 2p2, the second group of p block. This is 2p3, third group of p block, fourth, fifth, and so on. All the elements you can consider like this. You see, one more thing I'll tell you. p1, p2, p3, p4, you understand? 
that how only six group, why only six group we have in P block? Because we have only six different con P6, correct? Now this is the outermost shell two and two. So this outermost shell represents the period of that particular element. Like you see, boron belongs to what? Second period, you see? This is the second period, boron. So this outermost electronic configuration is, the outermost shell represents the period of that element. Right, suppose you have, I'll ask you, what is the outermost electronic configuration of gallium? The outermost electronic configuration of boron is 2s to 2p1. The outermost electronic configuration of carbon is 2s to 2p2. For nitrogen, it is 2s to 2p3, 2s to 2p4, 2s to 2p5, 2s to 2p6. Because all these elements belongs to second period, so their shell should be second only, the outermost shell. With respect to this particular information, if you try to write down the outermost electronic configuration of gallium, right? So this would be, I'll tell you, gallium belongs to which period? Could you tell me? Gallium belongs to which period? Fourth. It is two, three and fourth. Since boron has 2s to 2p1, so outermost electronic configuration of gallium would be fourth period, 4s to 4p1. If you want, you can draw. You will get the same configuration, 4s to 4p1. For aluminium, if you write, it is 3s to 3p1. So for the same group, all elements will have similar outermost electronic configuration. Number of period will be changed, but the number of out electrons present in the outermost shell, that won't change. It is 2s to 2p1, 3s to 3p1, 4s to 4p1, 5s to 5p1, 6s to 5p1, and so on. Could you tell me this one, what will write? The outermost electronic configuration of silicon. The outermost electronic configuration of silicon. Yes, it is 3s to 3p2 because carbon is 2s to 2p2. So it is 3s to 3p2, 4s to 4p2, 5s to 5p2 and so on. What about this uh, bromine outermost electronic configuration? Tell me guys, bromine. I want you to respond all of you in this. Bromine outermost electronic configuration. Yes, that's correct. 4s to 4p5. Okay? Because fluorine is 2s to 2p5. Fluorine would be 3s to 3p5. Bromine, 4s to 4p5. 5s to 5p5. So this is how we can easily understand the outermost electronic configuration of any element. Okay? Now, another thing you see. This is true for entire period table, here also. What is the outermost electronic configuration of helium, sorry, hydrogen? Hydrogen, 1s1. Could you tell me for cesium, what would be, what it should be? Cesium, what it should be? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. First period, 1s1, sixth period, 6s1, right? So 1s1, it is 2s1, 3s1, 4s1, 5s1, 6s1. Beryllium is 2s2, second period, 2s2. 
this would be strontium strontium would be 5s2 2 3 4 5 so like this we can have the idea of outermost electronic configuration of any elements clear tell me tell me guys very important if you are comfortable with periodic table it is very easier for you to understand this chapter and it helps you in entire chemistry tell me did you get it all of you okay now the next thing see we have classified the elements in blocks s block p block d block this two are f block okay we classified the elements in block my question is based on what category okay it is based on the last electron goes into which subshell if the last electron goes into s subshell it is s block elements if the last electron goes into p subshell it is p block elements d subshell d block elements f subshell f block elements like you see for these two group the last electron goes into s subshell only so that's why these are s block elements you can write down the electronic configuration of any elements you'll get the same thing here also you see for all these elements if you write down the electronic configuration the last electron always goes into p subshell and hence we have p block elements d subshell d block elements is it clear correct so that's also you can understand in s block we can have only two possible configurations one is s1 configuration other one is s2 that's why we have only two groups here one and two s1 and s2 if you talk about d block so d block can have how many how many electrons maximum in d subshell how many electrons we have maximum d subshell we have 10 electrons So the possible configuration is what d1, d2, d3, d4 till d10. Yes. So we can have ten groups corresponding to each configuration. So this one is d1, d2, d3, d4, and it goes till here. Zinc. That is d10 configuration. Clear? Right. That's why we have. two groups here then we have 10 groups and then again we have six groups so total 18 groups we have here right 18 groups and seven periods now you have the idea of periodic table how it is it is arranged what all things you can conclude did you get the idea of it tell me yes or no ah you have to yes i'll do that you have to just sit with this periodic table okay google it take a picture if you do not have book and then you analyze it one once or one or two you want like you know once or twice you have to do this then you will have the idea of it okay what i said first of all i just go by, go one by one in this the elements are classified in blocks why in blocks because it depends upon the last electron goes into which subshell if the last electron goes into s subshell 
it is s block d subshell so d block p subshell to p block f subshell to f block right so we have here two s block groups right group 1 and group 2 we have two s block groups why because we have only two configuration of s possible one is s1 other one is s2 finish similarly we have 10 d block groups because d subshell can have 10 electrons so we can have d1 to d10 10 different uh you know possibilities okay so we have two groups s block then 10 groups d block and then six group p block okay this is how it is arranged extreme left we have s block elements extreme right we have p block elements in between the two we have d block elements okay now next thing that all these groups has one specific outermost configuration like if you have first group its outermost configuration is s1 period can be anything 1s1 2s1 3s1 4s1 like that okay first group outermost configuration is s1 second group outermost configuration is s2 and s block is over if you talk about p block in p block the first group that we have p1 outermost configuration it is ns2 np1 then ns2 np2 ns2 np3 ns2 np4 ns2 np5 ns2 np6 okay if you see this groups and all right in terms of a and b then the number before a and b that is written here it is the number of electron present in the outermost shell right like 1a one electron in the outermost shell 2a two electron in the outermost shell 3a three electron in the outermost shell 4a four electron in the outermost shell if you talk about 13 14 15 16 it is simply it is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 and 18 correct so this number if you see group 13 group 14 with group 15 elements if you have this number the subtract 10 from that you will get the number of electrons in the valence shell so basically let's not make it complex much okay there are so many information i can give you after this also but a little bit of idea if you are getting 40% also it is fine for now okay but you have to sit back with the periodic table and you have to think on it like how the electronic configuration other thing changes and this is how the periodic table is okay Ah, that's fine. Fifty, sixty percent is more than enough. But again, you have to revise it before the next class. Okay. In fact, I would suggest that all these priority table, you know, you must revise the prior the the priority table before every class. Just go through once. Okay. You have a better idea of it. It's very important. Okay. Right. Another thing is what you see the atom. I'll just write down one simple thing here. What is the atomic number of hydrogen? One. Atomic number of lithium, three, then eleven, then nineteen, then thirty-seven, and then fifty-five, and then eighty-seven. the last one is 87 here usually what happens yeah correct correct ansh you see in sodium also the last electron goes into s subshell no that's why it is s block elements three represents the period third period you see there okay 
Now, the important thing I would like to mention here is usually what happens, we remember the atomic number of these elements, which are there in the top of the periodic table. Yes or no? Would you agree with me? We usually memorize these elements, atomic number, which is there on the top, right? But for exam, you should at least know the atomic number till zinc that you must remember. If you memorize till krypton, it's fine. But till zinc, you don't have any choice. You have to memorize atomic number till zinc, right? That's one thing. Sometimes if you want to have the atomic number or want, if you require atomic number of any lower elements, then how do we do that? So for that, we have a certain pattern that you can understand easily. Like you see, for your reference, I have written the atomic number of these elements, 1, 3, 11, 19, 37, 55, and 87. If you look at the difference here, the difference here is, you see, this is, it is 2, then 8, then 8, then 18, then 18, and then 32. The same pattern will follow in all other group except group 18. Group 18 will discuss it separately. Let it be. Okay. Difference is 2, 8, 8, 18, 18, 32. Okay. I'll write down in the bottom for the first group, group 1. Difference is 2, 8, 8, 18, 18, 32. This is the difference we have. Means what? Suppose you know the atomic number of hydrogen. You add 2, you'll get lithium, 3. You add 8, you'll get sodium, 11. You add 8 again, you'll get potassium, 19. You'll add 18, rubidium, 37. You'll add 18, 55, cesium. Add 32, 87, francium. This pattern is true from here also. Beryllium to magnesium, the gap is 8. Magnesium to calcium, the gap is again 8. Calcium to strontium, it is 18. This is also 18. And this is also 32. Okay. So suppose what is the, what is the atomic number of beryllium? Could you tell me? Atomic number of beryllium? Tell me. Atomic number of beryllium, guys. Four, right? So if you do not memorize, suppose, uh, magnesium, and suppose beryllium also, if you don't remember, you know the position, right? So hydrogen is one, helium is two, lithium is three, beryllium is four. Like this also you can do. So once you know this beryllium, you add eight, this is 12. You add eight, it is 20. You add 18, it is 38. You add 18, it is 56. You add 32, it is 88. Did you get the pattern here? Yes, tell me. Did you get the pattern? Respond. Right. So this is the, this is the, these numbers here, again, listen to me carefully here. These numbers, 2, 8, 8, 18, 18, 32, these numbers are called the magic number for group 1. Magic number for group 2, we don't have 2 here, but it is 8, 8, 18, 18, 32. And this is true for all the P block elements except helium. The magic number for group from for group two, group thirteen, group fourteen, group sixteen, group seventeen, group sorry, group two, group three, sorry, what did I say? Group two, group thirteen, group fourteen, group fifteen, group sixteen, group seventeen. Group two and group thirteen to group seventeen, the magic number is eight, eight, eighteen, eighteen, thirty-two. Only we have slight change in case of P block elements, sorry. Uh, this one, uh, inert gas, helium is 2, and then it is 10. So we have 8 here. 
not two. Here we have two. Here we do not have two. Two eight and then eighteen. Krypton is thirty six, and then it is. And then it is fifty four. And then it is eighty six. So gap, if you see here, it is eight. It is eight. It is eighteen. It is eighteen, and it is thirty two. Right, eight, eight, eighteen, eighteen, thirty-two. See here, eight, eight, eighteen, eighteen, thirty-two. So it is same for this also. For this also, you can consider. The position is this one s one, one s two, but still, this gap is not two here. Okay. So this kind of pattern you must analyze. You must remember. this helps you in finding out the atomic number of any element in the exam if you forget i would suggest in market or in amazon any other you know merchant you see you can buy a very large you know size periodic table do all these you know all these stubble everything over there and you can stick this on your wall right wherever you you know study or wherever you sleep wherever you, you know usually spend your time in the house then the wall you can paste you can stick it so that if you just you know go through it once if you just look at it once in a day you will have this in your mind in the exam you could easily visualize the periodic table the entire periodic table that helps you a lot did you get it Yes. No doubt in this. Okay. So I guess you uh, you all have understood what is uh, you know uh, the how the elements have been classified in the blocks. What is the reason for that? Okay. And what are the different blocks we have? Electronic configuration. You got the idea. Okay. now there are various terms that we use right different types of elements we have in this that will start after the break okay normal representative elements typical elements okay bridge elements diagonal relationship all these we'll see after the break correct so take a break now we'll resume the session at 6:45 okay 6:45 will resume take a break now guys
Okay, hello guys there. Okay, so uh, so there are uh, various you know classification of elements we have that you write down. Classification of elements. The first a type we have here is normal or representative elements. Normal or representative elements. write down these are the elements belongs to these are the elements belongs to s or p block these are the elements belongs to s or p block except noble gas All elements belongs to SNP block. Except the noble gas. Normal or representative elements. Second one. Typical element. write down these are the elements these are the elements which shows the property of these are the elements which shows the property of properties of other elements properties of other elements belongs to belongs to the same group these are the elements which shows the property of all other elements belongs to the same group so typical elements are typical elements are elements of third group these are the elements of third group not the second one elements of group 3 third group like we have sodium magnesium aluminum silicon sulfur silicon phosphorus sulfur etc sodium magnesium aluminum all third group elements you can consider okay sorry third period i'm sorry my bad third period yeah okay third period
okay so elements of third period represents the property of the other elements belongs to the same group like sodium represents the property of alkali metals first group right phosphorus represents the property of the nitrogen family right that group this thing here next write down bridge elements bridge elements write down typical elements are the elements which represents the property of the other elements belongs to the same group other elements belongs to the same group not period here right belong to the same group examples are the elements of third period examples elements of third period like we have sodium magnesium aluminium silicon phosphorus sulfur etc the third one we have bridge elements write down the elements which act as a bridge the elements which act as a bridge between two different group elements okay the elements which act as a bridge between the two different group elements are called bridge elements for example you see if you talk about sodium magnesium and copper the sodium belongs to 1a group this belongs to 2b group roman we should write this is 1a this is 2b group and magnesium present in between this, in between these two so this is the this is the bridge elements just definition you have to keep in mind another example is potassium you take calcium you take and silver so potassium is again 1a silver is 2b and calcium present in between the two so it is a bridge element of the two okay okay the next one is the diagonal relationship diagonal relationship write down some elements belongs to second period
some elements belongs to second period shows similar behavior with the elements of third period okay again i am repeating some elements belongs to second period shows similar relation with the elements of third period which are present diagonally opposite to them which are present diagonally opposite to them are called sorry diagonally opposite to them are said to have diagonal relationship again i am repeating this some elements belongs to second period shows relationship with or shows similar behavior with the elements of third period which are present diagonally opposite which are present diagonally opposite to them are said to have diagonal relationship right this one is important like you see if you look at the position here we have lithium sodium beryllium magnesium then we have boron aluminium calcium silicon so left to right you have to go diagonally like you see this one this one this one this one okay so these two elements are observed to have similar properties what all properties we'll discuss later in this chapter but these elements are said to have similar properties and this we call it as diagonal relationship because the elements are present diagonally to each other like this we don't define okay left to right we go that is a diagonal relationship okay fifth point transition element transition element these are the these are the d block elements these are the d block elements which has unpaired d electron these are the d block elements which has unpaired d electron okay which has unpaired d electrons in their ground state or excited state right these are the d block elements which has unpaired d electrons in their ground state or excited state like for example you see if you take an example of scandium okay or titanium titanium could you write down the electronic configuration of this 
all of you, please. That's what I want you to identify it. What is the position of titanium? No, it's not. Titanium is after scandium. Yeah, it's 22. That's right. Titanium atomic number is 22. Now you write down the electronic configuration. And I want you to write down the electronic configuration of zinc also. We have discussed it. Three S two, three P six, four S two, three D two. Okay, correct. What about zinc? Yes. So the electronic configuration here is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d, 2. Okay. For zinc it is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d, 10. In short, in terms of argon also we can write. Okay. This 3d electron you see, 3d has 5 orbitals. 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. And it has 2 electrons present according to Hunt's rule. And this has all the 5 orbitals filled, completely filled. Right. So transition element, the differentiation is what? D block elements which has unpaired D electron in their ground state or excited state, right? You see in zinc, all D electrons, we are talking about D electrons here, this electrons and this electrons. In zinc, these electrons are paired. Right? This one is not paired. Okay, so this one is the this one is titanium. It has unpaired D electron. So this is the typical element. Sorry, not typical, transition element. This is the transition element, right? This zinc is not transition element, it is D block element. So transition element comes under D block only. Okay, so this is the difference between the two, right? You must keep that in mind. The D block elements 
right, which has unpaired d electrons are called transition element. Which one, Oro? Hansul, you know, Oro? Could you think of Hansul over here? Okay, understood now? Because of Hansel only, it will, the pairing is not possible until all the electrons are, um, unless all the electrons are singly occupied, no? No, after 3D6 also it is transition. 3D7 also it is transition. Whenever you have unpaired D electron, it is transition. Except 3D10, yes. Right. So all transition elements are D block elements, but all D block elements are not transition elements. The vice versa is not true. Right. Transition elements are D block. But D block are not transition elements. Okay, so we have zinc, CD, and HG. For these three elements, the D orbitals are fully occupied. D10 configuration it has. That's why these three are D block elements. All other elements are transition. Right. See, one more thing I, I'll just show you here. Zinc, you know the configuration this. CD, HG, you see zinc, cadmium, and HG. These elements belong to the same group. I'll show you. You see this. Zinc, cadmium, HG. So if it is D10, this one is also D10. This one is also D10. So this, this is the one that I have written, the ZN, CD, and HG are D block <coughs> elements, not transition elements. This is the application of the pattern that we learned few minutes back, half an hour back. Okay. If this has D10 configuration, this also has D10 configuration. This also has D10 configuration. Hence they belong, since they belong to the same group. That's why these are D block elements, not transition elements. Did you understand this point? Yes, so all of you write down, all transition elements are D block elements, but vice versa is not true. Right, next write down inner transition elements. Inner transition elements are F block elements, that is it. Inner transition elements are F block elements. Write down inner transition elements. Inner transition elements are F block elements. F block elements, we have two series in this. two series. The first one is we have 4F series. 4F series means the electron goes into 4F uh, subshell. Right. 4F series, it starts with cerium, atomic number 58, and goes up to lutetium, LU, lutetium, atomic number 71. Okay. This has 14 elements because F can have 14 uh, electrons. So this series has 14 elements, right? And this uh, cerium to 
luteum this we call it as lanthanide series lanthanide series okay the second series we have that is 5f series 5f series it starts with thorium th atomic number 90 and goes up to lawrencium atomic number 103 this also has 14 elements also has 14 elements right and this we call it as actinide series actinides and lanthanides remember always lanthanide starts with cerium 58 goes up to lutetium 71 actinides starts with thorium goes up to lawrencium 103 did you copy this yes tell me okay now you see i'll show you in the periodic table i'll take the new one because again uh, you know see this i'll show you here okay you see here this is barium i'll write down here so that you can understand this is barium and its atomic number is 56 then this is 57 and this 57 is lanthanum it is 57 is lanthanum after 57 the atomic number should be if you see here it is uh, 37 38 39 40 41 like this it goes 37 38 39 40 41 40, like this it goes but here it is 55 56 57 57 ನಂಬರ್ಸ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಶೋನ್ ಓವರ್ ಹಿಯರ್ you see this is 57 this is lanthanum l a n t h a n u m lanthanum this one is actinum a c i t i n u m actinum right this one is cerium this is atomic number 58 you see this is cerium atomic number 58 and this is lutetium atomic number 71 so what happens after this lanthanum the electron starts fill into 4f orbital if you look at the electronic configuration for this one f subshell this one is 4f1 4f2 4f3 4f4 till 4f14 right 
So from cerium to lutetium, this series we call it as lanthanum series or lanthanides because it starts after lanthanum. That's why it is lanthanides. So it is always, you know, uh, you know, the students are confused in this one that lanthanides starts with lanthanum. No, lanthanum is not a part of lanthanide series. Okay, since lanthanide starts with cerium because the F subshell has one electron here, it starts filling here, right? That's why the series F series starts from cerium, from cerium to lutetium. That's why the lanthanide series starts with cerium and goes up to lutetium if you talk about 4F series. This is the same thing. It is actinum. It starts after actinum. This is 9T and this is 103 and this is 5F series. Okay. So this one is actinides. This one is lanthanides. They don't ask any question on this. Just you should know what is the first element and last element for the two series, lanthanides and actinides. Clear? Okay, so I want you to do some, you know, revision work on this periodic table. Whatever I have discussed today, right? You must revise this. If you have the, the periodic table with you, fine. Otherwise, you can easily get it online. Okay, Google it. You will get the periodic table. Open it and then you can check. Okay, all these things. Very important. If you have a better understanding of periodic table, it's very easy for you to understand this particular chapter. It helps actually in entire uh, chemistry, but especially in this chapter, it will be very comfortable. Okay, so this is the few properties we have discussed for, uh, you know, uh, initial properties we have discussed. Now, for a given elements, how do we predict the period, group, and block for that particular? Element? How do we predict? the period group and block write down the prediction of Prediction of period, group, and block. Right. Usually what happens, electronic configuration will be given in the question. Is given. Now, in this what happens, the period is period is the maximum value of maximum value of n. You can easily find out period for any elements. In the electronic configuration, maximum val value you check, that is the period. Okay. Subshell that is block Subshell means SPDF, right? Subshell or block B is the subshell in which subshell which takes takes the last electron. That's what we have discussed. No? S block, P block, D block. The last electron enters into S subshell. It is S block. So it is the last electron. Group, we have certain formula here. For S block, write down. Group, you have to find out. This two is done. For S, for, for S block, the formula is if the configuration is this, inert gas configuration, and NS1 like this. It means it is group one. Any doubt in this? If you have inert gas configuration and it is NS2, then it is group 2. 
S block, we can find out this. For P block, what we do? For P block, we'll write the group is equals to 12 plus number of electrons in P subshell. In P subshell, outermost P subshell. Okay. We can write down this 12 plus number of electron in P subshell. Why 12? Because you see, if it is 3P1, right? So 3P1 is this one. 3S2, 3P1 is aluminium. So we have 10 electrons here plus 2. So this 10 plus 2, 12 you have to add. Means in this 3P1, 1 plus this 12, then it comes to be 30. That's why we have that formula. 12 plus number of electrons in outermost P subshell. We'll do some example, you will get it. If it is D block, if it is D block, then group will find out group is equals to 2 plus number of electrons in n minus 1 D subshell. n minus 1, right? Penultimate shell. n minus 1 at D subshell. Not the last one, right? Suppose if you write down 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d1, right? So here the outermost shell is 4s, not 3d. Electron goes into 3D orbital after 4S because of its energy. But outermost shell is fourth shell. So outermost shell is fourth. This is N. So N minus 1 is what? 3. So one electron we have to consider here. Okay. This is what it means. Number of electron in N minus 1 at D subshell. If it is F block, write down this. If it is F block, for F block the group is always 3 always three because you see this again periodic table this is the f block right and f block is present here you see this present here this is fourth one and this is third group you have here f block third group so f block is you don't have to do anything if it is f block the group is always three copy this down Done? Okay, look at this example. One S two, two S two, two P six, three S two, three P six. You need to find out the period. Then we have block, and then we have group. One S two, two S two, two P one. X E four F zero five D zero six S two. Krypton 
4D10 5S2. Argon, 4S2, 3D6. Find out the period, block, and group. See, in the first one, the period is the maximum value of n, that is 3. You won't have any confusion in this period. Right? 3. Last electron goes into P subshell, the block is P. And for P block, we know the formula. It is 12 plus the number of electron in P. The group is 18th group here. Any doubt in this? Tell me. Yes, guys, please respond. Okay. This one, the period is 2, the block is P, and it is 12 plus 1, that is 13 group, boron. This one is maximum value of N, period is 6, block is S. And if it is S block, N is 2 configuration we have, so it is group 2. Right? Period is 5, block is S. Is it S block? It is D block because electron goes here. It is like 4S2 and 3D. Like 4S first and then 3D. I have written it this way, but first electron goes into 5S and then it goes into 4S. Energy also, if you see, the 5S energy is 5 N plus L value and this one is 7, right? This has mode energy fills later right so it is 5 block is d and for d block we have the formula that 2 plus 2 plus number of electron in n minus 1th d subshell that is 10 n is this n minus 1 is 4 10 so 2 plus 10 that is 12. this one again the same thing Right, so this is uh, 4, D, 2 plus 6, that is 8, 8th group. <laughs> Did you understand this? Guys, respond. Any doubt? All these questions you can easily do if you have a better understanding of electron, this uh, periodic table. Right, you can easily use that, but actually the formula, if you memorize, you can save your time in the exam. That's why the formula is given. Okay? Fine, guys. Thank you. So we will continue from this next class. Okay, we'll see some more properties next class. Okay? Yeah. Take care, guys. Yeah, thank you. Bye.